Good morning, City Church. How's it going? Good to be here with you all this morning. Um, it's a blessing every time that I get to share uh, with this church. As Pastor Chris said in a video, I am Andre Beasley, and I serve on the elder team here at City Church. I've been attending here since 2019, and uh, it's just been a blessing to get to know some of you. And even though now the church is expanding, I don't know many of you. So if you ever see me, feel free to stop me and say hello. It's always my pleasure. Um, God has a word for us this morning. Um, he has a word for us this morning. Um, but I will say uh, there is one caveat that it, it may be a little challenging. Uh, the message may be a little bit challenging that I give you today. So prepare your hearts and minds. All right, we've been in a seven-week series titled Stories with Substance. And so Jesus often spoke using parables so that we are, he wanted to make it a little bit easier for us to remember and understand. So he put it in story format. And so we've been walking through those stories, but these aren't just any stories. These are Jesus' stories. And so, and because they're Jesus' stories, they can change our lives if we allow them to. And this story is no different. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to uh, Matthew chapter 15. Cell phone devices are as well. Hello, everybody online that's tuning in with us. We're always glad that you're, you're here with us as well, but please come and join us if you get that opportunity to do so. So before I get into the key text, um, a couple years ago, I made a decision to um, be intentional about how I connect with people. And I started practicing that mostly with the people that I encounter here at City Church. And so one way that I uh, go about doing that is when someone asks me the question, how are you doing, I try to be authentic when I answer that question. Because we all know how it goes. When you come to church and someone asks you, how are you doing, how do you respond? Good. Blessed. Well, give me some more. Well, alive and blessed. And, that, and that's how we, how we respond. You know, blessed and highly favored. Sometimes I'd be like, I'm hanging on. The old school would say, no, you're pressing through is what you're doing. I'm like, so yeah, I'm pressing through. Well, last Sunday, uh, a couple of brothers walked up to me and asked me how I was doing. And I was very tempted to give the typical answer. But I didn't. I decided to press in. And um, honestly, on the outside, things are going well, Right? I love the Lord. I serve the Lord. I, I, I come to church. I'm a part of an amazing body of believers. Uh, my wife loves me. Uh, my kids love me most of the time, right? Um, I, I have a portion of health and strength. I have a job. I have transportation, roof over me. All of these things are great. And so I shouldn't have any complaints. And then that's how we feel sometimes, right? We really shouldn't be complaining about too much. But if we're real with ourselves, it's more going on inside of us than we like to reveal um, to others, and sometimes more than we want to reveal to ourselves, right? We find ourselves working all the time or doing whatever it is that can distract us. And so that's where I was last week. I had all of these, these things. I wanted, oh, God's good. But in actuality, you know, I was heavy in some areas. You know, there's some important relationships to me that, you know, I've been pressing into and praying that God would just move in a special way in those relationships. And if I can be honest with you, I'm like, God, you're taking too long. <laughs> Anybody else got anything like that? God, you're taking too long. All right. Especially if you have adult children. I love y'all, by the way. I'm not going to take y'all there, but you're taking too long. Then there's some, some joy and con some contentment that I'm after that I've been searching for. This has been a rough season. You know, when you're engaged in ministry and you're, you're helping people and you're pouring out all the time, People are going through a lot of stuff, right? And if we're not careful, if we're not guarding our hearts properly, some of that can get into us. And so, you know, um, this has been a blessing for me. Um, it was challenging for me to preach this message because of where I am, but God is faithful, right? So he has something for us this morning, and he's going to reveal to us how inward transformation, inward transformation, not outside, you're looking good, by, by, the, by the way, brother. Very good. That's my guy, Jose. He's looking good, man. You know, I'm trying to be like Jose. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time cleaning up the outside, but not as much time on the inside. And some of us may not even know how to go about doing that, right? 
because we haven't been taught how to do that. Our society, our traditions don't really lead us down that path. And so we've come to find that, you know, we, we've, we've become accustomed to cleaning up the outside. So this story, this parable is going to help us do just that. Be transformed inside rather than focusing so heavily on what's going on on the outside. So Matthew chapter 15, verse 1. We're going to be uh, primarily in Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 through 20. But I'm going to just go through, uh, for, go through 1 through 9 right now. Then the Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Jesus replied, And why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what they might have used to help their father or mother is devoted to God, they are not to honor their father or mother with it. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Pray with me, saints. Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, for this opportunity to unlock your word. Lord, I pray that you would open up our hearts and open up our minds, even my mind. Help me to see what it is you need me to see so that I can live out the life that you've called me to live. Break up, Lord God, our heart of stone. Break up that fallow ground, Lord God, and plant a word in us, Lord God, that bears fruit 30, 60, 100 times what was planted in us. And we will be careful to give you all the honor, the praise, and the glory. Father, as I decrease, I pray that you would increase. Have your way in us. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. And all people's, God's people say it. So uh, Matthew chapter uh, 15, um, what we have here is Jesus is about halfway through his earthly ministry. And he has, he's been doing his thing. He's been healing the sick. He's been making the, the lame walk. You know, he's been teaching with power and authority. And he's been drawing people to God. Here in this situation, we have some religious leaders that have come to question Jesus as to why they are not following a tradition. Most of us may look at this tradition and be like, y'all not washing y'all hands? <laughs> like, like, come on, Jesus, I thought y'all was better than that. But as we get into the text, you're going to see that it's not just about hygiene and sanitation. It was something else going on. And I have to give you a little bit of context uh, for this passage, or we'll miss what God has for us here in this text. So verse 1 and 2, it says, Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? What they're referring to is a set of laws that were not really laws. They were oral traditions that were passed down from generation to generation because these individuals, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, who had dedicated their lives to following God on the outside, following customs, rituals. They went to church every, every Saturday, Friday, Saturday, right? They were there at the synagogue. They followed these rules, right? But then they ended up creating thousands of other rules, and then they encouraged the community around them or told them that they were going to follow these rules as well, and we call this the oral tradition. Why? You may be wondering why, why all the rules, Andre. Why? Well, the people of God were a, very, a chosen people. You might have heard this before. The Israelites were a chosen people, right? a holy generation, a holy priesthood. Thank God we're all part of that too, right? We're all part of that now because of Jesus, right? 
But they were called, and because they were called, there was this covenant that was put in place. For those of you who don't know this, a covenant is an agreement. Where are my husbands and wives at? Husband and wives. You're in a covenant with your wife. We don't use that word covenant too often, but for those of you who are in that specific covenant, there's some rules and some guidelines, right? Some of them are unexpected. You don't realize you're in this, in this agreement <laughs> until you actually get married. But the people of God were very familiar with the covenant, and so they created some extra rules to keep people on a straight line. We have traditions in our, in our world, too. Some of them are not created by religious leaders. Some of them are created by our politicians, our media personalities, right, social media. Many of them are created by our professors in our schools, but they're focused on the inside, on the outside, excuse me. They're focused on the outside. God is the only one who can really impact this. We can try, but we get tired. So let's look at uh, Matthew chapter 15, verse 3. Let's get it down further into the story. Jesus replied, why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, honor your father and mother. Hmm. And anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. To death? Let's, did they say to death? Does your, Bible, does your Bible say that, my brother? I... We, we don't follow that right, right now. You know, I, I look back to my childhood, and if we was following this, I wouldn't be here. And by the laughs that I hear, many of you wouldn't be here either. Some of you probably thought you were about to die. But that's strange. It's, it's, it's strange to our ears to hear capital punishment for disrespecting our parents? We're familiar with honor your mother and father. That's part of the Ten Commandments, TJ, right? Honor your mother and father. What does it mean to honor your mother and father? To show them honor, to show respect, to show reverence, to care for them when they're in need. And I know many of you don't want to hear it. I see, boys, people scratching heads right now because this is a tough one. Some of us have some rough relationships with our parents. And this isn't the central um, part of my message, but since Jesus decided to use honoring your mother and father as the example as to how we use our traditions and we lift those up, but then we dismiss the commands of God, I'm going to press into it. I'm going to press into it. I told you this is going to be a little bit of a challenging message, right? Right? Proverbs chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. It exhorts us, listen, my son, to your father's instruction. And do not forsake your mother's teaching. They are a garland of grace to your head and a chain to adorn your neck. Amen? <laughs> That's a tough one. I wanted to um, press pause because I had a, r a rough relationship with my parents. Challenging relationship. Good parents. They tried their best. They strive to keep me in church. They strive to live out the life that, um, a life that I could follow. But they failed in many ways. And like them, I fail in many ways. I want to give you something real quick about your parents. Honor your mother and father is the first commandment with a promise. So that you may live long in the land your God is giving you. You, you expect it of your children, correct? I encourage the adults, those who, you know, my age and above especially, whether your parents are on earth or not on earth, Honor your mother and father. Honor your mother and father. 
Now, some of you are like, you don't understand what I went through. And, that, and that's okay. You may need to put some boundaries in place. You may, you may need to put some healthy boundaries in place to make sure that they aren't able to harm you anymore. But God's commands cannot be made void because of what we've been through. If we can allow this command to be made void, we can make any command void in God's law. So we have to be careful not to do that. And we're going to look at something real quickly. Nate Hamlin shared a a wonderful message with us on uh, forgiveness last week, yes? Powerful, powerful message. I was sitting there in the back of the room like, Nate, how am I going to preach this message following a message on forgiveness? Because before I could get up here and talk to you, there were some things that God had to work in my heart. And there's some things that God needs to work in your heart. I feel it. This message isn't about Andre. This isn't about City Church. This isn't about Pastor Chris. This is about the work that God wants to do in your heart specifically. Some of us are so removed from what's actually going on in our mind, we're so distracted by it that we'd rather just go through the motions. It's easier. It creates this safety net. If you give me a checklist, where are my checklist people at in here? I know I got some checklist people in here. Beth, go and raise your hand. That's my wife. She got her hand up back there. Because she already knows. She wants that checklist because there's safety in a checklist. And then when you're not following the checklist, oh, I can just do that tomorrow and I'm going to be good. But God is calling us to something else. Let's jump over to Mark chapter 7 real quick. Mark chapter 7. The same story that we're reading about now is also in Mark chapter 7. Uh, The entire chat, well, from verses 1 through 23. We're just going to cover a little snippet of that. The people of God were struggling. They weren't just struggling to to honor their parents. They were struggling with several commands. And Jesus is going to reveal it it here in in verse 9. And he continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. I love Jesus. Like he, He tickled me last night when I read this. He said, Andre, you have a fine way of setting aside my commands to do what you want to do. You have a fine way. Now, I, I like how you did that, Andre. We have a way of, of strategizing on how to work around the commands of God. The bad part is, is that the commands of God are all for our good. Again, I know this isn't a popular message, but this is, a, this is like going to the doctor. Anybody like going to the doctor? No, I don't like it either. I don't like the dentist either, but I go. This is what this message is about. Verse 10, for Moses said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is Corban, that is devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and you do many things like this. Many things. Many things. And, I'm, you know, I got to search my heart. I got to search my mind. They have found a way to use this practice, this tradition called korban. It was an offering that they would set aside and dedicate to the temple. It didn't have to be money, but oftentimes it was money or or some other resource. And so they, they, they went in. Not only do I get to not support my parents, I get to look holy while I'm doing it. That's when we're really being dangerous. When we're allowing traditions to distract us and misguide us and move us into a direction that violates another part of Scripture, there are many things that we're doing this way. Many, many things. And I include myself in that too. And I'm like, God, help us. How do I preach this? 
So I, I, put, I put a few traditions on the screen for you, and I'm going to start with the first American tradition that all of us love, all right? And it is materialism and consumerism. We love our stuff now. We got so much stuff in America, storage units is popping up all over the place. Everybody got storage units all over their neighborhood. We got storage units in America, boy. We got to hold all our stuff. American culture often prioritizes wealth. Wealth is not the issue, it's that we prioritize it. When we get up in the morning, we're thinking about our stocks, or we're thinking about our bank account, or, or the lack thereof, right? 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. For somebody like me who grew up poor, this is an easy one to like dive into because I'm trying to be certain. I'm trying to be safe, right? I, my, my focus is on here and God's been, been, been washing me. He's been cleansing me of that, but it takes time. Let's look at the next one, individualism. I'm me. I'm grown. Right? In American culture, we value our rights and our personal freedoms. I'm going to just tell y'all right off the, top, off the top, I'm a gun guy. I like my guns. Don't mess with my guns now. I'm saying it. I'm a combat vet too, though. Ooh, ooh. But sometimes our rights can get in the way of our obligations. They can get into, look at this, look at this verse right here. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but, but each of you to the interests of others. Hmm, that's a tough one. Workaholism, again, some of us, our trauma is linked to the one that we're going to be that we're going to be most struggling with, right? Workaholism. We celebrate people working all the time to the point that they're just drop dead tired. I know I got some workaholics in here. I'm a recovering workaholic. <laughs> Exodus 20, verse 8 through 10. Remember, well, it says 11 up there, but remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day to the Lord. On it, you shall not do any work. Y'all ain't got to y'all ain't got to raise your hands and confess. I know for sure that people in America struggle with keeping the Sabbath holy. Don't matter what day of the week you choose, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we have to take a day off. If you're called by the name of Jesus, you know why he wants you to take a day off? Because he wants you to remember, one, he wants you to rest, but two, he wants you to remember, it's not about you. When I was worried about my finances, man, I was getting all worked up. God was like, take some days off. I'm like, what? Days off? My wife always gets upset. I just told her last week, I'm going to six days a week. She's like, why? Remember the Sabbath. I'm like, six days a week. Because she don't want me to bump it up to seven, you know. Because she know I will bump it up to seven in a heartbeat on you. Politics. Y'all want to talk about politics? <laughs> I ain't going to do it because I'm on social media. <laughs> strong political identities, right? If you have a strong political identity or an affiliation, that can lead you astray. Right? Look at, look at what Scripture says. But our citizenship is where? In heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody here, you're, you, if you believe in Jesus, you are an ambassador. This is not our home. Y'all think if Biden stays in office, it's over. And some of y'all think if uh, Trump uh, takes office again, oh, everything's over. No, it's not. It's not. Stop allowing the Pharisees, I mean the political, I mean the media people 
to tell y'all that it's going to be over. No, it's not. Trust me. All right. So last but not least is the pursuit of happiness. Ooh, we love that happiness, don't we? But that happiness is fleeting. It was one thing that made me happy when I was a young person. And then I got older, and then something else made me happy. It's all these different things, right? The American ideal is that we should be able to pursue personal happiness and self-gratification. Whatever makes me happy, I should be able to do it, right? That sounds right. But it's not. Look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek first the kingdom, his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. That's a promise. Do I got any witnesses in here that that's a promise? When you make that shift in your mind from focusing on traditions, right, and you start focusing on him and his righteousness, like stuff just starts to fall in your lap. Man, test him in this. Not me. Test the Lord in this. So before we shift into the uh, final stages of this, this talk, I want to address something with you, City Church. All of us are impacted by traditions. Black, white, everything in between, everything outside of. We're all impacted by traditions. We are a multi-ethnic multi-generational, multi-economic church, very diverse. My time here has been marked mostly by, beef. I'm beefing with the young folks, because I was raised by old folks, so how my mind works don't work like a 25-year-old mind. It just doesn't. My son, um, he's back here in the back, love to embarrass my kids when I'm up here. Um, you know, I He's about to be 16, and I got him a cell phone when he was 14-ish. I'm like, man, you old school. Yeah, my son ain't no cell phone. And so I allowed my son to have his cell, like a lot of freedom with his cell phone initially because I wanted to see what was going to happen. Bad mistake. (laughs) Bad mistake. Sorry, son. He walking around there almost decrepit, like literally. He ain't eating. He ain't drinking no water. <laughs> a wind just going to come by and blow him away, and he just going to be gone. I was like, but we, we got to do something about this. Like our son just about to get blown away in the wind. So I took his phone, and I started putting some parameters around, like, okay, you can have it from this time to this time. And guess what? He started coming back to life. He started eating, he started putting lotion on, you know. He started spending time with his siblings. I'm like, oh, we great. This thing right here is sucking the life out of some of us. And not only is it sucking life out of us, guess what it's doing? It's pouring thoughts, ideas, and things that are not of God into our hearts. Because it goes into the, the, the eyes and the ears, and then it goes into your mind, and then it seeps down into the heart. I don't know. Who got yards around here? Anybody got some yards? Y'all love yard work, right? No. Nobody loves yard work. No. We got a few crazies that do like the yard work, right? But if you, start, if you don't get out there and touch that yard, what them weeds going to do? Man, you weeds taking over my yard right now. The whole backyard, right? And it's the same thing with this. The traditions and the media, it goes into our mind and it seeps down into the heart. So we have these weeds and these thorns growing in our heart, choking out the life that God is trying to get to you. So if we don't take any time out of our day, TJ, to just stop and be like, God, okay, what is it? What's going on with me? If somebody, next time someone asks you, hey, how are you doing? You don't have to give them the real answer, but promise yourself this. You will pause that day and be like, how am I doing? Where am I with God? What, what, like, what's, what's going on inside of my mind? In City Church, we're very diverse in here. There's been some instances, and I don't think it was intentional, 
But we got to be very careful with thinking that our traditions, our ethnicity, our economic status, right, our age gives us this superiority over the other people that are part, are part of City Church. Each one of us has something very special to offer the body. And next week, I'm going to jump into the gifts and the talents that God has given you and how you can start to bring those things out. Matthew chapter 15, verse 10. Let's go back there. Jesus uh, turns his attention away from talking to the religious leaders and the YouTubers and the social media influencers and the politicians and the media. And he says in verse 10, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen and understand. Listen and understand. I want to pause real quick because this is, if you checked out or you're just now joining me, like cognitively, right? This is an important piece that we're about to get into. Jesus uses a, a Greek word here uh, for listen that means to listen very intently. Very intently. This is the part that we need to take with us. If you don't hear anything else that I said this is the time that you need to zoom in. Not because I say so, it's because Jesus says so. Not like our kids when they say, yeah, I hear you, and then they don't do it. This listen is hear it, let it go into your mind, let it go into your heart, and then do something with this. And some of the things that I'm going to tell you, you're not going to get it today. It's going to happen tomorrow, or it's going to happen next week when you're in that situation with a loved one or when you're worried about finances and how you're going to pay the bills or uh, when you're about to make a decision that can change your life. This is when this truth is going to bubble up to the surface. And then he says, understand. He wants our minds to search for different ways that this can apply. There's somebody in here who came in here today tired. You're tired. You feel like you're in this cycle. And you're just going through the motions. And you're waiting on a breakthrough. This message is not it. Man, when we get up here and talk, it's so tempting to get up here and want to perform and get, oh, good. God is like, no, Andre, what this is about is the heart. And my prayer is that as we jump into this next part, that God, that you don't put the blinders up. Open up your mind. Open up your heart. Listen to what God is saying directly to you and only to you. He has something greater for you than this. So let's, let's jump in here. Let's jump in. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. That word defile means to be contaminated. Polluted. We don't use that word too often in our vernacular, but this generation understood exactly what Jesus meant. What it meant was is that you were unfit. You were unworthy. You were, it's, sometimes when you were defiled, you were unworthy even to come into the house of God. But praise God that Jesus made it available for us though, right? It's not what you're putting into your mouth that's separating you from God. It's what's coming out of your mouth. Let that sit with you for a second. It got me. Maybe I'm the only one. I don't know who struggles with this. Then the disciples, verse 12, came to him and asked, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when you said this? Jesus was offensive sometimes. Christianity is offensive sometimes. What God is calling you to may be offensive sometimes. That's not our aim. We're not trying to be offensive. Young people, the older generation is not trying to offend you. We were raised differently than you were. 
We were raised by a, a separate set of principles than you were. But guess where we can meet at? Right here. We can meet right here in the, in, 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 in the word of God. It doesn't matter if you're old, you're young, what your ethnicity is, what your economic status is. Status is. We can meet right here in the word of God. Galatians chapter uh, 1 verse 10 says, Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings? Whew. It's, it's tough. Or am, I try, or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Man, that's heavy. I don't know if it's hitting y'all as heavy as it was hitting me because I'm like, man, we, we, we want to be accepted. We want to be invited to the party. We don't want to be excluded from what's going on. As soon as you, some of y'all, as soon as you became a Christian, what happened? Your friends jetted. So then you, you kind of insert yourself into these Christian circles, and then you're like, oh, they're weird. <laughs> and so then you find yourself in this like, kind of like zone. It's like, I don't know what to do. And then we kind of just relocate ourselves to like, okay, I'm just going to go to church then. I'm going to read my Bible. Oh, sign up, sign me up. I'll serve. And we want you to do those things. But Christianity, what got the way, they called it the way. The way is so much more than just coming here on a Sunday. That's only one day a week. I love what Jordan and them do on the stage and Crystal and this team. I love it. They continue to help my worship grow by bounds. God loves our worship. He, it's a sweet-smelling aroma to him, right? It's a sweet-smelling aroma. But guess what? Unless it's from the heart, guess where it's from? It's external. I can lift my hands in this place and still be going to hell. And that's the truth. And it's a scary truth. You can come in here week in, week out, and none of this penetrates your heart. God doesn't want that. Jesus doesn't want, want that for you. Matthew verse 15, excuse me, chapter 15, verse 13. He replied, every plant that my heavenly father has planted will be pulled up. Has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them. They are blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. Nope, they're not the ones. The one that you've been listening to on social media that get you gassed up and ready to do something stupid. Nope, they're not the ones. The media commentator that gets you all agitated and anxious about the coming election. Nope, they're not the ones. That friend of yours, you know, that you're trying to impress but gives you sly comments that make you feel bad at yourself, about yourself? Nope, they're not the one. Has the Holy Spirit ever just whispered to you like, nope? <laughs> That's him. That's his voice. Like, he uses words like, nope. I'm telling you, Holy Spirit talked directly to you. Not every leader or influencer. So when I say leader, I'm talking about influence. Not every influencer or leader has been planted by God. You'll be able to tell by watching them. I love what Paul said. He said, whatever you have learned or whatever you have see, uh, learned or received from me, go do that thing. And me as an elder, man, that's a, that's a tall order for me. Because I need to be able to stand up here and say, Danny, how you see me live my life? I want you to go ahead and live your life that way. And that's challenging if my life doesn't look like what it says it should look like in Scripture. But it's something very careful. It's easy to spot them out because usually when you have a leader that hasn't been planted by God, ask this question. This is the first test. Where is the source of their strength? Listen. Listen. Because if the source of their strength is them and their talents, their abilities, and not from God, that's the first sign, right? The next one, how are they living their lives? 
None of us are perfect. All of your leaders in this church, every church across the world, we all still need work. I know you keep hearing about a lot of, you know, pastors that have sin in their lives. There is not one person on this earth who does not. I want to clear this up. That's Pastor Chris too. I don't know if he's still here or not. He don't tell me about it, but <laughs> every person on this earth has sin that God still needs to work on. So I want you to keep, be clear on that. All right, they're not Jesus. Now, we are held to a higher standard, all right? Not every leader has been planted by God to lead you. Verse 15, Peter said, explain the parable to us. Don't you love Peter. He always says those things that we're all thinking anyway. <laughs> Are you still so dull? Some people be like, man, Jesus is disrespectful. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why, you know, I try not to like gas this because like I'm more like that Jesus. Anybody more like that Jesus who talks like this? And I tell my wife, Jesus did it, but I'm not Jesus. <laughs> Are you still so dull, verse 16, Jesus asked. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? Yeah. Jesus is getting graphic. <laughs> but the things that come out of the person's mouth come from where? Look at your neighbor. She said, oh, no. <laughs> Look at your neighbor. That person that you're looking at, I'm not going to make you say anything. I want you to look at them. That's the, that's the outer person. There is an inner person that's going through some stuff. And so when we're interacting with one another and people aren't being nice to you or they're not saying hi to you, they got some stuff going on in here just like you do. Right? Just like you do. Verse 16, let's close this out. Excuse me, 18. But the things that come out of the person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. Mm. These are what defile a person, but eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. Jesus is not saying something really revolutionary, but it was revolutionary for them. And it should be revolutionary for us because if we're being honest, we focus mostly on the outside. You don't have to say amen or uh-huh, but we do. When you wake up in the morning, the first thing you think about is brushing them teeth. <laughs> I hope that's the first thing that you're thinking about. <laughs> and then we're looking in that mirror to make sure that we're put together. Some of us are focusing on kids, and that's good. But we got all of these different concerns, right? But Jesus is asking you a question today. Are you focused on the heart? Because that's what he's most concerned with. He is most concerned with your heart today. So what do we do? Because I feel like we're trapped. The more that I try to be good, the more that I find that I stumble. The more that I try to clean up the outside, the more that I was like, man, I got a long way to go. And some of us have given up. My aunt called me a while ago. You know, I was on a treadmill, so I was feeling good about myself. I hadn't been connected to my family in a while, and she gave me a call, and she said, Andre, how are you doing? I was like, I'm on a treadmill. <laughs> he laughed because he already know. I felt good because I was doing something to move me closer to a goal. But she said something that sticks with me to this day. Thank you, Auntie. She said, Andre, whatever you do, don't give up. Some of you in here are close to giving up. And the giving up that I'm talking about is on this walk. Like, man, I tried this Jesus stuff, it don't work. I tried this whole, you know, coming to church thing, it just don't work. 
It's because it's been too much focus on externals, but God has something for you today. So I'm like, God, okay, so what do I do? How do I get this done? Oh, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to follow my heart. No, no, that's not what I'm telling you. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I thought you said it's about the heart, Andre. No, not your heart. The heart that God is going to give to you. Nate shared this uh, verse last week. Powerful text. I'm like, Nate, you stole my verse. Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Ain't that an amazing promise that God gave us? Is there anybody here that needs a new heart and a renewed spirit? The people of God were in a terrible place when God gave this word to Ezekiel. They had been disobedient. They had been worshiping idols. They had been scattered across the earth. The promised land that God said that he would give to them, they didn't have access to it. And he said, I am going to give you a new heart. So how do we do it? I didn't know. God gave me this like a few days ago. And I said this first service, and I'm like, Pastor Chris, he just was, he was blowing me up all week. Because he knew this was a tough message. He wasn't blowing me up, but he was checking on me. He's like, man, you good? You good? I'm like, oh, what did I say? Yeah, man, I'm good. How you doing? Oh, I'm fine. Blessed and highly favored. That's the outside. But in my heart, I'm like, man, I'm struggling with this thing because, man, God is confronting me with some specific things. Look, young people, it's not going to be easy. Older people, it's not going to be easy. But with God, all things are possible. All things are possible. So we're going to move over to James chapter 4. That's where the solution is. We got all of these traditions going on. We got traditions. We got social media. We got leaders telling us that it's the end of the world. Jesus stuff don't work. What is the solution? God gave me this, and I'm telling you, again, listen and understand. If you checked out again on me, listen and understand. This is so important. James chapter 4, verse 7. It's a word. This starts off with a word. I know you don't like that word. Because we're we're individuals. We're leaders. We lead the way. So that very first word of this, it, it, it messes with us. Submit yourselves to God. That's that's his word right now. Don't need an amen, don't need a hallelujah. This is a a word directly from God in Scripture, but also downloaded. I don't know who this is for, but somebody's been wrestling with this thing. You've been wrestling with some behaviors that you're trying to get rid of. You've been wrestling with some addiction. You've been wrestling with some sin. You've been wrestling with some strongholds in your mind. There's people in here who's been uh, anxious, having almost anxiety attacks about, like, what the future holds. How are you going to pay for this? How are you going to care for your kids? Am I going to be good enough? The word that God gave City Church on this morning is to submit yourselves to God. And he will come near to you. Is there anybody else that needs God to come near? Hey, man, I'm telling you, just think about it. Like, do you believe... I need God right now, right here on this stage. Like, I need you to come near, God. I need you to come near in my relationships. I need you to come near in my finances. I need you to come near uh, in my emotional state. I need you to come near in all of these different ways, God. And he says, wash your hands. There it is again. But he's not talking about dawn or joy. He's talking about our hearts, our mouths, our actions. But God, I don't know how to do it. I've already been trying to do it. That's the thing. He didn't tell you. Does it say try? Does it? 
Does, does anybody see try? Look at James. Put James uh, chapter 4, verse 7 through 10 up there again. Anybody say try? You say come to church. Does it say read your Bible? These are all, I'm not saying these aren't things that you shouldn't be doing, but if you don't submit yourself to God, then none of it matters. My husband's getting on my nerves. He's always trying to tell me what to do. Submit yourself to God. Husbands. Man, she nagging me, man. She had me sleeping on the couch last night. Submit yourself to God. I have this addiction that I've been dealing with. I've, 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 I've battled through it, but it keeps crop, keeping Come cropping back up. Submit yourselves to God and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. The worship team is going to make their way back up here to uh, finish up our time together with a a time of reflection, okay? Prayer team, allow the spirit to move you before you come up. But this space is open. This space is open. And it's not really about the space, remember, because that's external. Some of you, you can sit right there in your seat. You don't have to get up. But some of you have been needing to come up front. God has called you up front and you have not responded. And so your submit yourselves to God is to get up out of your seat and to come up. For others, it's just a heart posture. God is saying, this is where I wanted you. I wanted you sitting right here in this spot so that you can hear so that you can reflect so that you can receive there's one thing I want you to to, to take away from you take away today is that surrender is the solution Surrender is the solution to our problems. We don't like surrender because God put something in us that we just don't, you know, we, we're eternal beings. He, he made us kings and queens on this earth to reign and have dominion. And no, we're not really supposed to be coming down under unless it's him, unless it's his people, right? God wants us to surrender. He needs us to come down off the throne of our lives. You didn't know you had a throne. Danny, we got a throne. I got a nice one. My throne is nice, Danny. And I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to come down off that throne. I want to stay in charge. I want to be safe. I want to lead my family the way that I want to lead my family. And this is a daily thing. You can come up here today. You can give your life to Christ. You can say, all right, God, I'm about to do it right now. And you can walk out of here and just forget it. This is a moment to moment. This is a day to day. Okay, God, I'm, I'm just opening myself up to you today. So surrender for some of you may look like, you know what, all right, today is the day. Don't do it because of me. Don't do it because this was a, a message. Oh, this touched my heart. I think I'm going to give my life to Jesus. Do it because God is calling you. Do it. If, if, if you acknowledge that you're a sinner, And you know in your heart and believe in your heart that he was the son of God and that he came to earth to die for your sins and that he was raised from the dead, then salvation is available to you today. Whether you come or you do it right there in your seat, it's available to you today. It's not after you've checked all of these boxes. It's available for you today. And if you may make that decision during this time, make sure you connect with one of our prayer team members before you leave. Or you fill out the connection card that's in the seat in front of you. 
Surrender may also mean for others that, you know what, I'm just going to sit here and examine myself and allow the Lord's word and, to, and, and allow the, his spirit to, to show me what's wrong. As a matter of fact, let's pause for a second. Keep the music going. Yeah, I hear you, baby. That's what God wants for us. He wants us to cry out. He wants us to cry out, Lord, we need you. Lord, we need you in this place. Lord God, examine our hearts. Examine our minds. Lord God, show us where we've allowed tradition and cleaning up the outside, Lord God, to take the place of you. To take the place of being in intimate fellowship and communion with you, God. Lord God, there's pain here in this place where there's, there's, there's bitterness here, Lord God, in this place. Lord God, there's unforgiveness, Lord God. There's trauma in this place, Lord God. There's sickness in this place, Heavenly Father. There's anxiety in this place. There's, there's depression in this place, God. We bring it all to you. We bring it all to the foot of the throne, God. And so as the worship team is singing, Father, I just pray that you would drop down the walls of our hearts, Father God, and that you would open them up, that you would strengthen us, that you would keep us that you would move us deeper, deeper, deeper into who you are and into who you created us to be. It's in your mighty name that we pray. Amen.